first time that I'm going live on my phone. Okay, it's an iPhone 8. It's aging. It probably needs to be replaced soon, but we're going to see how this goes. Hopefully you guys can hear me. There's nobody on yet, so you can't hear me. But uh, that's okay. This is going to be recorded. You guys are probably going to be watching this later. So here's what we're going to do. Um, usually when I go live, I give some advance notice and I get pulled into the live chat, which is a lot of fun. Uh, but this time I put some questions out on my community post. So I'm going to start with those. I'm really aiming to get through all of the questions in that community post. Um, but I think I'll have time for questions here as well. So please, uh, if you guys have any questions at all, put it in the live chat. I'm going to try to find myself on my laptop as well, this stream, so I can, here we go, popped right up, so I can easily see the live chat. All right, so mute this, mute, and the chat. Okay, I guess that's the chat. Good. So let's get into, probably see the chat on here too, can't I? Live chat, yes, good. Sorry guys, this is my first time doing this on my phone. So it's, you know, an, an, an experiment. So we're gonna get into some questions from my community post. Uh, the first one from someone who's not me, Mike Geo. Hey, Brad, Unicure has been floating on Acquirer's multiple screener for the past few months at $29 to $33 a share. Uh, the stock plunged 30% today on news that their treatment for Huntington's disease was well tolerated in the initial phase. I would assume that that would be good news, um, but I guess the market didn't like uh, whatever that result was. Their books are solid, but insider investors are a weak point. Is this stock on your radar? Um, I've never heard of Unicure. Uh, let me just quickly pull up a little info on ticker about it. It's a biotech company that seems to fit. Uh, yeah, it, it took a dive. I mean, I think it looks like yesterday it was at around $29 a share, and now it's $20 a share. Uh, one thing I really love about Ticker is you can go into an, an individual stock and click on a news tab. Uh, it looks like there is, there is news out from today. Uh, let's see what this says. Um, yeah, it doesn't seem to be negative news, but you know, this isn't really my wheelhouse biotech. Um, so I don't fully understand how to assess these results. So I haven't looked at Unicure. I'm quickly going into the valuation tab just to see why it might be showing up on acquirers multiple. Yeah, so on, on an acquirer's multiple basis, which is just enterprise value divided by EBIT, uh, earnings before interest and taxes, it is trading at 1.6, okay? That is incredibly low. So that's, uh, but trading on an enterprise value to revenue basis, uh, it's five. So there, there's something very wonky. Normally, if you looked at EV to at EBIT, that would be higher than EV to revenues, but in this case, it's flipped. So uh, definitely something to, to dig into there uh, for sure. Oh, sorry, that was next 12 months, EV over revenue. So last 12 months, EV over revenue is 0.9. Okay, so that's that's consistent with, with what I might expect. Um, but again, th this isn't really within the realm of something I think I can wrap my head around. Uh, so I, I won't be looking at Unicure any more than I just did. Uh, what would you? What would make you start a position in Semler Scientific? Brendan asks. Uh, so between us girls, I have started a position in Semler. It's a it's a small position. It's kind of a starter position. Um, but I am very intrigued by Semler. 
Uh, as most of you probably know, I found out about Semler seeing that it was on the 13F for Yen Liao of Aravd Global. And Yen actually recommended a book, one of his top five business books, Genghis Khan and the Makings of the Modern World. Fantastic book. I highly recommend it to all of you. Um, but I mean, his his framework for the kinds of investments that he's looking for resonates with me so much. He's really looking for companies that can compound um, earnings at 20% per year for 20 years, okay? I think he calls it earnings power for 20% uh, per year for 20 years, which is incredible. I mean, if you can get an opportunity like that, uh, compound at 20% over that length of time, you're going to be doing very well. Um, so, you know, I definitely pay very close attention when Yen Liao takes a new position in something. And he did just recently, um, third quarter, which the price now is less than it was at any time in the third quarter. So uh, that's pretty exciting. So I got a I got something in the chat and it disappeared. I don't really know how to work this on my phone. Let me just jump over here. Hello from Chicago, old school millennial. That's funny that you're in Chicago. I'm actually going to Chicago tomorrow. Okay. So uh, my wife's family is from Chicago. So we're going to be spending about a week with, with them. And then we're going to go to Wisconsin. We're going to drive from Chicago to Madison, Wisconsin, and spend another week with my family because uh, I grew up in Madison, Wisconsin. So uh, big shout out to you, old school millennial. And of course, Jack, my near and dear friend on Punch Card, Jack, uh, is in Chicago as well. Uh, Vinay, why is this new test for PAD even needed? Is the benefit only that it saves time? Um, it saves time. <sighs> so it's, it's not just that it saves time. Um, you know, it, it's two to four minutes versus I think 15 minutes for, uh, the ankle brachial index. Uh, it's also a little clunky to perform the ankle brachial index test. Uh, you've got to remove clothing. You've got to apply gel. There's a certain skill, like like these these practitioners who are applying ABI, ha have to have a decent amount of training for how to do it properly. Uh, and you know, time is a big deal. I mean, if 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 you can do something in three minutes versus do something in fifteen or twenty minutes, that's the difference between a lot of practitioners just not even doing it if it's going to take 15 or 20 minutes. So uh, I don't think that can be understated, the, the time savings for that particular test. Um, so that's, you know, this is a company I'm, I'm really just starting to dive into, starting to learn more about. Yen Liao um, mentioned in Equity Mates that some of the positions that they own, they've spent three or 4,000 hours really wrapping their minds around those companies. So, um, you know, I've probably spent maybe 20 hours or something like that, really trying to sink my teeth into it. So, you know, I'm, I'm really just scratching the surface. Um, just wanted to say hello. Thank you for your opening my eyes to many different ways of doing research. Hebrew Richard, thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, Scott, I visited the Wisconsin Dells a couple of years back. Very nice place. Yeah, uh, Wisconsin Dells, it, it, you know, it, it's sort of a water park um, getaway in, in Wisconsin. Um, it was okay. It was all right. I, I, <laughs> not, not really fully my cup of tea. I did really enjoy the go-karts uh, that I experienced in the Wisconsin Dells. I really like go-karts. For whatever reason, Jonathan, hello from Arkansas. What's up, Jonathan? Uh, Shifan, Shifan, hello from New Caledonia. I don't even know where New Caledonia is. 
please, please let us know. Um, Alibaba, is it one of those few opportunities that we should grasp boldly and come few in life, as Charlie Munger says? You know, none of this is investment advice. Um, with a company like Alibaba in China, uh, with a government that many of us, you know, it's, it's very foreign in terms of how that government uh, regulates and operates. And so, um, you know, you, you've got to get to a place where you're comfortable. Uh, owning something like Alibaba. And that's going to take a lot more work for some people than it would for others. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, still very happy to own Alibaba, even though I paid much more uh, than, the, than the stock currently trades at. Um, but again, I, I don't give anybody advice on what to do around Alibaba. But Charlie seems just as bullish as ever. Uh, Fish, thanks, Brad. I made an investment in Racist via Fidelity and I bought several months ago. I should be up according to the Turkish Stock Exchange ticker, but when I open my account, it's negative. Hmm. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about that. Uh, I I haven't checked in a while, but when I look at RACIS in my Fidelity account, it's showing a gain. I would just look at what is your cost basis? What does it say your cost basis is in Fidelity? And what does it say the price is in Fidelity? Just to, you know, just be working with one source to try to triangulate what's going on there. Uh, Maximilian, we got a, we got a super chat. Similar looks amazing. Found any negatives yet? Um, in a weird way, uh, the big negative that I found with Semler is just that I, I can't find any negatives with it. To me, that's a red flag. Okay. Um, I mean, there's, there's little negatives here and there, like, you know, right now they're really just a one product company, uh, which makes them vulnerable. Hopefully once they have a couple more shots on goal, as Yen Liao says, um, there's just, uh, it's, it's, the competitive advantage, right? The moat over time strengthens because there's a little bit of diversification in terms of uh, revenue streams with Semler. So, um, other than that, you know, I haven't I haven't really found anything, and I really want to find something. I haven't dug back into the comments after I put out that video on Semler, so I'm hoping a few of you have brought some red flags to my attention there. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Maximilian. I'm going to jump back real quick into uh, my community post to see what people are talking about there. Any thoughts on my top two speculative stocks? I'm thinking about taking a position soon if they dip a bit further. Uh, Weber barbecues. So I used to own a Weber. They seem like uh, a good product. And DraftKings. Um, so these aren't companies that I've looked into at all. So um, can't say I have any suggestions on those. Um, but, you know, to me, just reading this really quickly, just because they're dipping, uh, that alone would not make me comfortable taking a position. Um, I mean, because there's nothing to say that these weren't egregiously priced. Uh, three months, six months ago, and that the all-time high should not be used uh, to gauge whether something might be worth getting into or you know, how far it's dropped below the all-time high. People talk about that a lot, and that just seems silly to me, like as if the all-time high reflects something about the underlying business. To me, it just reflects uh, the manic depressive nature of the market. So I, I don't, I don't pay much attention to how, you know, how much the price prices have swung in different companies. I want to see, you know, can I get some sense of what the value of the business is based on the cash flows? Um, and if I can't, it's it's a pass. Uh, Rich Gang, how a company can increase earnings without increasing value. Could you get into what happens in terms of accounting when this happens? Well, a company could easily raise a bunch of debt 
uh, bad debt, right? Debt with bad terms in order to increase earnings, right? They could take that debt. They could advertise more. They could put more eyeballs on the product. They could probably move some product off the shelves. So they're increasing earnings, uh, but they've actually decreased the value of the company because they've increased the earnings at the expense of using expensive capital, okay? So that's one example. I'm sure there are many, many examples uh, of how a company can increase earnings without increasing value. Um, if you have a return on invested capital that's lower than the cost of your capital, uh, you can you can increase earnings to the moon, and you're just going to be driving down lower and lower the value of that company. Okay, so you got to you know there's, there's a lot more to it than earnings, and a lot of investors you know primarily pay attention to earnings per share or price to earnings ratio, uh, and management teams know that right, and there's a lot of ways. Uh, that management can game those numbers. You know, often they get, um, you know, they get incentivized financially to hit certain targets around e EPS, uh, and that could be a dangerous thing. So you really want to pay attention to the right metrics and understand, you know, is this increase in earnings actually beneficial uh, to to shareholders? Hopefully, long term shareholders. That's that's how I um, view businesses through the lens of being a long-term shareholder. Uh, Nestle, the compounding machine, I wish it goes cheaper. Yeah, what has Nestle done real quick here? Um, there's a number of different Nestle's. Uh, this is this is a... Um, this is the one in Malaysia. That's probably not the one I want. Let's see, Nestle. How about this one? Because where is, is Nestle in Switzerland? Yeah. So I'm looking at the one in Switzerland. So if I look, how is it compounded over the last 17 years? Um, you know, eight and a half percent CAGR. It's, it's a four bagger over the last 17 years. So that's not very impressive to me, actually. Um, maybe it's more compelling looking over, I don't know, a shorter time period. But um, I'm not seeing the long-term compounding nature at least showing up in the numbers that I'm looking at. Um, but yeah, it's it's awesome when those compounders get cheap enough to to really get excited about them. Like PayPal, I was watching PayPal drop recently. Uh, it didn't get quite low enough to where I wanted to pull the trigger on it. I think it bounced back recently, um, but it, it gets very exciting when you have a high conviction about a business that you know you want to own it for a long time. And the price, just for whatever reason, you know, the market beats that stock up. Uh, that gets very exciting, um, at least from my perspective. We have another super chat from Maximilian. Thank you. How do you personally judge debt quality? Uh, low interest rates. Verizon has a lot of debt, but people, Morningstar, say it's acceptable. Um, yeah, I, I think the big question, low interest rates is part of it. Um, but what what is the business going to do with that debt? Is it a is it a high value activity? Right. A lot of companies raise debt, maybe to make acquisitions. Um, sometimes even to buy back stock. So you've really got to weigh, okay, what is what is the cost of this debt as a long-term shareholder? Um, and, and what is it being used for? You know, what is the value add of the activity that's, that it's being used for? As, and is it worth that additional risk uh, to shareholders for that company taking on that debt, right? When a company takes on more debt or, or any debt, now you've got stakeholders that have a claim to the business that are higher up than you are, okay? You get knocked down that chain. Um, and, you know, that, that, can, that can be concerning. Uh, so, you know, there's a, there's a lot of shareholders who look at debt and think automatically, you know, this is bad, right? 
Uh, but, I, you know, it, it's more nuanced than that. I think you've really got to judge the capital allocation skill set of the management team. Um, like, I think when Tesla, when Tesla, I think Tesla raised a bunch of debt. They, they issued more stock. Um, no, it, it was it was issuing more stock at, at what seemed like crazy prices when they were doing it. Uh, but I, you know, I, I thought it was a smart move, right? Because the, the prices were so high. Um, I was like, yeah, this is a great time to issue more equity. Uh, so, you know, the, there, there's, there's a lot that goes into that, but, but thanks for that question, Maximilian. And, and again, for the super chat. Uh, okay. A few more from, we're almost done with questions from the community post and then I can focus solely on you guys. Uh, let's see here. When are you starting your podcast? Yeah, you know, I don't have any immediate plans to start a podcast. Um, I actually tinkered with a podcast once upon a time. It was in a whole different niche. It was actually in like a sustainable agriculture niche, permaculture, sustainability. And it is a lot of work. It is a whole lot of work. For any of you who have watched uh, the Tim Ferriss podcast, I mean, he puts so much, it is a full-time job for him to prepare uh, for those for those interviews, for those podcast episodes. And he does a phenomenal job, uh, but it is so much work um, that, you know, I, I'm not in a hurry to do it. Um, it it's probably a smart idea in terms of, you know, building a brand and, um, and all of that, but I, I don't have any immediate plans to do so, but maybe if enough of you nudge me in that direction, uh, I won't be able to resist. So thanks for that poke, Matthew. Patrick, company like Viot, V-I-O-T, a Chinese company, its net debt is negative 200 million. So it's got net cash of 200 million. And the market cap is 160 million. Doesn't make sense. Yeah, it would seem on the surface uh, that a situation like that doesn't make sense. But, I mean, again, stock price, I, I tend not to pay too much attention to stock price fluctuations. Um, but it's gone from $16 to $2 uh, in the last nine months. Okay. So that is a, that, I would be very concerned that there is fraud going on with this company um, or, or something, something very hairy uh, beneath the surface. So the situation here, if a company has more net cash uh, than it does equity, that doesn't necessarily mean you're buying the business for free, Okay. Um, because ultimately you're putting that capital in the hands of the management team and there's nothing preventing a poor management team from squandering all of that cash and running that business into the ground. And then what do you have at the end of the day? You've got a goose egg in your portfolio. So, um, to me, especially in the market that we're in now, uh, a company that has more net cash than equity is is a very big red flag. Uh, and I would be kicking the tires very hard to try to understand uh, why does the market think this company is worthless, right? Because that's, that's essentially what the market is saying. Uh, there's a very good chance that it is worthless. So, um, but yeah, it's a good question. Brother Leo, ah, Brother Leo, any word on ANHYT, uh, the Turkish insurance company, are you buying? Uh, no, I, I haven't bought um, any of that Turkish insurance company. This looks to be uh, the second Turkish buy from Monish Pabrai, uh, according to some of the things I've seen. I haven't seen anything uh, completely definitive on this. Um, but it seems like Pabrai is buying into this one. Um, yeah, insurance really isn't, isn't in my wheelhouse of, of businesses that I feel comfortable with. 
so until I see anything definitive that Pabrai does indeed own um, A-N-H-Y-T, uh, I'm, I'm not planning on doing any work on it or buying it for that matter. Uh, and lastly, Chris says, China, Baba. That's very concise, Chris. I, uh, I don't think that's a question, but I'm still holding firm on Alibaba. And um, uh, I, I think I'm in it for the long haul with that one. So, you know, hopefully, hopefully things turn around. Uh, let's see. Going to get back into the live chat. So if any of you watching live have, have any questions, pop those in. Um, agreed time is a big deal. Would like to look at the time savings versus cost for new test. Thanks for sharing your research. Yeah, I don't know what the cost of the incumbent test is, that um, ABI test. Uh, but but the, the the numbers that Yen Liao did throw out for Semler, we're talking about Semler Scientific here, uh, is that the cost to run that test, the uh, quanta flow test, is recouped 50 to 100 times over um, by the the offices that use that test in the same year. Okay, I think this is in reference to the uh, insurance companies uh, that that run these tests. So it's you know the return for them is incredible um, when it comes to using that quanta flow uh, test for the peripheral artery disease. Uh, let's see what else have we got here. NC is a French ter territory closer to Fiji, New Caledonia. Okay, close to Fiji. Cool. I actually spent. What was it? I spent like three or four days in Fiji. Uh, my last semester of college, I flew to Fiji and then I flew to New Zealand and then I flew to Australia and I spent the last semester in Australia. Uh, this was back in like 2005. Okay, so it's been 16 years. Um, but I got fried in Fiji, guys. I looked like a lobster. Okay, I totally underestimated the strength of the sun there. Uh, of course, I was white and pasty. It was winter in Wisconsin. That's when I went to Fiji. So it was it was not a good situation. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a lot more to Fiji than, you know, me being an idiot and getting sunburned. I should probably go back. Um, seems like a really cool place. I also made the mistake of... You know, I went on a little trip to an island, and you know, there was nothing to do on the island. Just kind of sit and sit in the sun, read books. That's not really my speed. You know, I like to get out and explore. So I didn't quite play the Fiji card very well last time I was there. Uh, we got Deaf Guy. What's up, Deaf Guy? Thank you so much. Love the videos and live streams. Keep them coming. We're going to be keeping them coming. I don't know why I said we. You know, a lot of YouTubers do that. Maybe... It's these different aspects of me. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, Chris, hey, from Germany. What's up, Chris? Thanks for being here. Chiffon, I have got my IBK account, but not possible to get racist. Uh, okay, Interactive Brokers from... So this is this is the guy close to Fiji, uh, the French tor territory near Fiji. Uh, unfortunately, Interactive Brokers there does not support uh, the Turkish market, it sounds like. Fidelity is, does not offer accounts for non-U.S. residents. Has anyone been able to get racist as a non-U.S. resident? Yeah, I know. I know there's some Europeans who have been able to get uh, a hold of racists, some Germans, I think. Uh, but connect with, who is it on Twitter, Enrico? And I always forget his last name. On Twitter, if you connect with Enrico, uh, Enrico La Quatra, I think he's done some work on how to get racists um, outside of the U.S. I think also in the Discord for Punch Card, uh, there's people who have shared different ways to get a hold of racists outside of the U.S. So those are those are two resources I can suggest. 
Uh, by the way, for racists, it looks like it's at 37 cents USD. So maybe inflation has eaten into profits, even though it is higher, which would show it as negative. Let me just take a quick peek at racist, what's happening here. So let's see. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's what's happened. I think, uh, you know, there's there's been more of a hit on the Turkish lira. So for me, it's showing 39 cents. I think I bought about, about around there. I bought somewhere in the 40 to 45 cent range. So it looks like I'm uh, down a bit on racis, even though it's up in Turkish lira. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see what plays out uh, over the long term with racis. But the lira is not looking good uh, in the short term, unfortunately. And that's that's hurting at least, you know, holders of racis uh, that, that don't live in Turkey. Um, whoa, I just looked up DraftKings. I remember it being at the 60s and it's 27 now. Pretty impressive drop for something most people said would never fall. Yeah, that's pretty common. When you get a stock that people get all excited about, right? It's a fresh IPO and nothing can go wrong with this company. People say, that's never going to go down. You know, people said that to me with Alibaba, believe it or not. Um, once upon a time, I, I think Alibaba was around 260 or something. And I put out a video. I said, you know, if it gets around 220 or 230, I'm going to start looking at this. You know, I've had it on my watch list for around 220. And people were like, yeah, it's never going to get down that low. You're going to miss out if you don't buy in now. So, you know, it, it just speaks to the, the psychological aspect of investing in the markets, right? Fear and greed, fear of missing out uh, is just a huge piece of this game. Uh, and, and if you can develop ways to deal with that, to not let that influence the, the rational, you know, the rational behaviors, buying when something is is you know, compelling from a fundamental perspective. Um, you're going to be far ahead of the crowd. Uh, when you open Fidelity, does it say you own Rasis? No, it does not say I own R-Y-S-A-S. It says I own R-Y-S-K-F, okay? Um, yeah, same with Fish. Uh, but again, the broker assured me I own the actual stock in Turkey. So, you know, it's just a little awkward, right? They're saying you own one thing and it's showing up as a different ticker, uh, the over-the-counter ticker for racists, which was suspended for a while. It may still be suspended. So, yeah, it's a little wonky. Scott, I don't know if you're already aware of this, but the dudes over at Everything Money will be interviewing Monish Pabrai soon from what I remember. Whew, Everything Money? Pabrai, Really? Bry. Bry. Everything money. Well, they do have about 10 times as many subscribers as I do. So, you know, I think part of part of Pabry's um, you know, education, part of his uh, strategy for, you know, educating, he I guess he mandates that when he does a Q&A for a university, he says it must be recorded and I must be able to upload it to YouTube. So um, maybe it's part of his funnel is to get this big exposure on social media, you know, YouTube, Twitter. I think he just crossed 100,000 followers on Twitter and 50,000 subscribers on YouTube. So clearly uh, this, this means something to him right, to put this energy into growing on social. Uh, so, you know, through that lens, everything money is a much better bet uh, than coming on to the stock compounder. But I, I will say I'm quite confident that I would have better questions for him than everything money because I've been following him. I've been consuming his content religiously uh, for probably like three years now. So 
I'm hoping I get a crack at him soon in terms of interviewing him, asking him some questions. But, you know, shout out to Everything Money. Uh, kudos to them for getting Pabrai to agree to a Q&A. You know, Pabrai doesn't do that very often, especially outside of a, of a university setting. But that's cool. Uh, and it gives me hope. It gives me hope. Let's see. What else here? Um, my AirPods are dwindling in their battery life quickly. So we'll see how much longer we can go here. Uh, probably not too much longer. If you guys have a burning question, hit up the super chat just to make sure I get to your question. Or if you just want to support the channel, which is me. Um, uh, what else have we got? Shifan, I saw a valuation of PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa, and it seems Visa is a better buy compared to competition at these current lows. Um, fair enough. Yeah, I haven't done much work on any of those. Um, Visa and MasterCard seem more widely held by super investors, from what I can remember. Uh, it seems like you know, Visa ownership count 22, at least of the gurus that are tracked by Data Roma. Uh, MasterCard is 15. So 22 for Visa, 15 for MasterCard, and eight for PayPal. Okay, so that gives you some sense of what the gurus think of them. Uh, I know Fundsmith, Fundsmith might own all of those. I know they own PayPal. Pretty sure they own Visa. So I mean, these are great businesses, uh, and I think I think they're actually going to be able to navigate the whole transition to blockchain uh, and Web3 and all of that pretty well. I think they've got enough tailwinds um, that that they're going to be just fine going through all of that. But um, yeah, I haven't done too much work on them. Uh, Boomer, Brad, I'd be more than happy to have a podcast on investing and permaculture. Ooh, yeah, that'd be fun to, to mix those. Um, Boomer, do you have a podcast uh, that you're inviting me to, or you want me to create a podcast at the intersection of permaculture and investing? Honestly, I'm not sure how I would, how I would merge those at this point. Uh, so that, that would be that would be interesting to, to try to do that. But anyway, uh, I'm glad there's someone out there who's who overlaps with that weird um, interest intersection. Siva Kumar, Lilu buying Berkshire means he wants to be more defensive now and switching towards values from growth. He has done this many times in the past. Okay, so it sounds like Lilu may have sort of like a Howard Marks style approach to the markets where he's got a general sense of um, where risk is in the market in terms of, you know, are, is, is it more likely that things are going to be, uh, that returns are going to be poor moving forward, or is it more likely the returns are going to be strong uh, based on, you know, val the amount of speculative investing going on. I'm not saying this very well, um, but yeah, I, I can buy that. I, I could, I could see why Lilu would would be using that filter and and perhaps going more into a play where the downside is heavily protected, as opposed to a play where you know, there's, there's a lot more upside potential at this stage of the market cycle. So I've never heard Li Lu talk about that, um, but I could buy that. Old school, what's your approach for adjusting valuations to consider COVID bumps? I don't, I don't consider the pandemic uh, as I'm doing valuations. Um, because I really don't, I, I don't look at the next one or two years. Um, it's, I want to be a, an owner for five to 10 years. And so all of this is just short term, a short term blip. At least I hope that's the case. I hope we're not living through a pandemic um, for the next five or 10 years or more. Let's see. 
okay, telecom stocks are down, 100 years of companies, 100 years old companies and return dividends. Do you think of taking some portion on a value portfolio? I like Eric, which is Ericsson with all network upgrades coming up for 5G. Um, yeah, telecom is, isn't an area that I've, I've spent much time on either. So I'm not going to be able to add much value there. Uh, last two, hopefully you guys can still hear me, uh, that my AirPods haven't died. Uh, EJ, EJK all the way. Ooh. Infidelity now, you can trade racist without having to call the trading desk each time. Just ask them to clear you for penny stocks and you can trade through the app. Okay, uh, good to know. I'm, I'm not planning on trading racist anytime soon, but thanks for that. Public service announcement, EJK all the way. Uh, lastly, David, what are your top three investing books? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, right off the top of my head, I'm really digging Genghis Khan and the makings of the modern world. Uh, I know it's top five for yen. It might be top three for me. Um, it really... I'm getting more and more away from traditional investing books like, hey, this is how I invest, uh, kind of getting into the weeds of investing and more into, you know, things that seem like they're outside the realm of investing, like physics and biology and evolution, you know, all these things that Charlie Munger talks about, because uh, investing is such an interdisciplinary uh, field uh, endeavor. And so I'm reading more and more outside of books that would be in the investment section in Amazon or in Barnes and Noble. Um, but I did like Richer, Wiser, Happier a lot. That's, that's a recent one I've read that I really liked. Um, so the two top of mind, Richer, Wiser, Happier and Genghis Khan and the makings of the modern world. Uh, that's what I'm going with. I know that's just two. What do you think about Nestle? I, I don't have an opinion about Nestle. I haven't really looked into it. Um, seems like Guy Spear thinks highly of Nestle, I, although I don't think he owns it. Uh, Gardner Russo own it for a big part of their portfolio. Or own it for a big part of... Yeah, I, Tom Russo, he's not a guy I follow very closely. Um, I think he has a whole lot of positions, and that kind of steers me away from uh, really looking at what he's doing. But I'm just looking real quick. I want to see if I can find what uh, what Russo what Russo owns, or what what his concentration is. Okay, so he is fairly concentrated, actually. Okay, Nestle is his second largest holding. Uh, at least in Data Roma, I'm going to look at Gardner in Ticker real quick to see if there's some international stuff uh, that's above that. Yeah, the All In podcast I was watching for for a little while as well. Uh, yeah, so in in Ticker as well, Nestle is his second largest holding. Uh, so my question would be, when did he buy it? Okay. So I'd probably try to go back through uh, Russo's 13 Fs and see, you know, what what was what was a compelling entry point for Russo, and try to compare that to uh, what does it look like today, both from a business fundamental perspective, how is how have the business fundamentals changed, and also how has the price changed, and try to triangulate with that a little bit. Um, but yeah. The industry that Nestle is in, food products, it's 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 not an industry I've spent much time on. Uh, I know there's a couple food products companies that uh, Terry Smith owns. So clearly there are some businesses in food products uh, that are just incredible long-term compounders, right? It seems like Nestle might be one of those. Um, but yeah, I, I just don't know. I just don't know much about it. And it's not all that interesting to me, honestly, uh, this kind of business. So I, I don't see my sp myself spending a bunch of time 
getting to know it. Uh, a couple more. Hopefully you guys can still hear me. Uh, does it show that you actually own Rasis or RYSKF? It shows I own RYSKF. Um, so that's that's the boat I'm in as well. I've been following all in. I had the hint of Solana at 147. So now we're getting into crypto, it sounds like. Uh, after it went up to 260, now at 181. Do you think All In Podcast has good value? What are your favorite podcasts to listen podcasts to listen to? Um, yeah, I think I think they're pretty smart guys. Uh, I think there's probably value to listening to the All In Podcast. Um, which ones do I listen to? Honestly, there there aren't really podcasts that I listen to regularly. Um, often in my Twitter feed, people will recommend different podcasts and I'll, I'll get them that way. But I don't have like subscriptions to a number of podcasts and religiously listen to uh, each release. I mean, big shout out to Investing with Tom. He has his own podcast. I've definitely listened to a number of those episodes. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm more into... <clears throat> audiobooks right now uh, than I am into podcasts. And I think that kind of ebbs and flows over time. That's just where I'm at now. Uh, but yeah, I, I think the All In podcast is, is probably worthwhile. But you know, not, I don't think any of those guys are, are public equity investors. Um, so, you know, if, if you're trying to get a stock tip or something like that, uh, it's probably not going to come from the all in podcast because they just don't, they don't focus on, on that area, uh, on that market. Uh, but again, they, they seem like very smart guys. Uh, there's a lot of politics uh, in the all in podcast, which, you know, I, I could, I could tend to do without, but, uh, yeah, hopefully that answers your question, Chiffon. Okay, guys, thank you all for being here today. I know this was very spur of the moment, um, but it's fun to do that. You know, when I have a minute, uh, and since I'll be traveling tomorrow to Chicago and then spending two weeks in the Midwest, uh, you know, I figure I'll take this kind of last moment while I'm still home to connect with you guys. And hopefully I can do some of this on the road as well. But um, yeah. Thanks again all for being here. Uh, a couple more. Boomer, no re reversing climate change. They invite guests from sustainable bakers to biologists, farmers, community leaders. Um, so apparently th there's a there's a reversing climate change podcast. That sounds cool. Yeah, I'll have to check that out. Thanks for, uh, for letting me know about that, Boomer. Uh, do I do options trading? No, I do not do options trading. I, I've bought a few leaps in the past. Uh, most of those didn't work out very well. And they just kind of changed my wiring. They, they make me uh, much more short-term short focused, like I'm constantly checking on things. And I, I don't want to be doing that. Uh, it's not something I enjoy. Um, yeah, cool. Thanks, guys. Uh, I am. So Vasco, I, I did take a starter position in Semler. So I mentioned that earlier, but uh, you just came on. So wanted to mention that uh, before logging off, I have taken a starter position and I'm, I'm quite excited to see where that business goes. So um, you guys will be hearing a lot more from me on Semler, I'm guessing. Okay. Thanks so much, guys. I will see you all in the next one. Take care.